pen. Look for my pen, y'all. I'm looking for my pen. One second. Okay. Out of all the other pens and all the other places in the house, everybody always want to get my pen right here. Right here. I'm going to thank Shalom, Linda. Shalom. Peaceful greetings. Peaceful greetings. Happy Friday, everybody. Facebook, YouTube. It's February the 4th, 2022. Day 22 of year four of reading through the books of the Law and the Prophets. Another four year consecutive day count. Day 1040, 1040. Today, y'all, we reading tablet number five. And then we're going to pick up in my big toe where we left off that day before yesterday since we didn't get to it yesterday in chapter 19. We might finish all of it. Then again, we may only get through a page or two, depending on what time we are at. Tiffany. Sawubona, yeah, yeah. All right, y'all. Let's get started. Kurt. Shalom. Let's go ahead and do the Shema. Deuteronomy chapter 6, a call for a wholehearted commitment. Joy, shalom, shalom. Auntie Belinda Brown, shalom, shalom. Great rising, grand rising. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations <clears throat> that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land that he swore to give to you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. It is a land with large prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods that you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig and you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. When you have eaten your field in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must only use his name. You must not worship any of the gods of the neighboring nations. For the Lord your God who lives among you is a jealous God. His anger will flare up against you and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massa. You must diligently obey the commands of the Lord your God. All the laws and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. You will drive out all the enemies living in the land just as the Lord said you would. In the future, your children will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them, we were Pharaoh slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give to our ancestors. And the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so that he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day. For we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands the Lord our God has given unto us. Hallelujah. 
Yahuwah is one. Glory and praise, O great spirit, Yahuwah, creator of all spirits here in our physical realm as well as the spirit realm. May we always glorify you. Hallelujah. Thank you for the prayer every day. Yahuwah is one and everybody over there behind that screen name. All right, y'all. Tablet number five. Synopsis of the fifth tablet. Audrey, shalom, shalom. Okay. Synopsis of the fifth tablet. Nema arrives on earth with a group of female nurses. She delivers seeds to grow elixir providing plants. She brings in little news of their out of wedlock son, Ninurta. In the Abzu, Inki establishes an abode and mining sites. In the Eden, Enlil builds space and other facilities. Niburian, Niburians on Earth, which are called Anunnaki, number 600, 300 EGG, operate the facilities on Lamu, which is Mars. Exiled for date raping Sud, Enlil learns of the hidden weapons. Sud becomes Enlil's spouse. Ninlil bears a son, Nanar. Nenma joins Inki in the Abzu and bears some daughters. Ninki, Inki's spouse, arrives with their son Marduk. Clans form on earth as Inki and Enlil beget more sons. Beset by hardships, the Ejiji launch a coup against Enlil. Ninurta defeats their leader Anzu in aerial battles. The Anunnaki, driven to produce gold faster, mutiny. Enlil and Inerta denounce the mutineers, and Inki suggests to artificially fashion primitive workers. You can't see it, you who is one, but Tiffany over here on Facebook, she said, I like that, you who is one. Okay, so this shows a, a picture of Enlil, Ninma, Inki, and Izzy Mood. It's a Sumerian depiction, so I'm going to show it. Just in case you don't have the book yet, I'm going to show it on Facebook first. Make sure it's clear. So if you want to screenshot it and look at it later. Okay, I think that's clear. All right, YouTube. Okay, I think that's clear. Okay, the fifth tablet. From the planet Lamu, the chariot departed toward Earth, the journey it continued. Around the moon, they made circuits, a way station thereon to explore. Around the Earth, they made circuits toward a splashdown, slowing. And the waters beside Iridu did Nungal, the chariot, bring down. To a quay by Enlil constructed, they stepped off. Boats were no longer needed. Enlil and Inki, their sister, with embraces, greeted. With Nungal, the pilot, they locked arms. The heroes, male and female, by the present heroes, were the shouts greeted. All that the chariots had brought was quickly unloaded. Rocket ships and sky ships and the tools by Inki design and provisions of all kinds. Of all that on Nibiru transpired... <clears throat> Of the death and burying of Alalu, Ninma, her brothers, told. Of the way station on Lamu and the commanding by Anzu, she to them related. Inki of that uttered approval. Enlil, words of bewilderment uttered. That is Anu's decision. His word is unalterable. Ninma to Enlil was saying, For the maladies relief I have bought, Ninma to her brothers said. Trina, hey girl, hey, Alicia, ya, shalom. From her pouch, a bag of seeds she brought out, seeds in the soil to be sown. A host of bushes from the seeds shall sprout, a juicy fruit they will produce. The juice and elixir shall form, for drinking by the heroes it shall be good. Their ailments it will chase away, happier their mood it shall make. In a cool place, the seeds need to be sown by warmth, by warmth and water, need they nourishing. So Ninma did say to her brothers, the place that is 
I'm sorry, the place that for this is perfect, I will show you. And Lil said to her, it's where the landing place was fashioned, where an abode of cedar wood I have made. And Enlil's skyship, the two of them, Enlil and Nenma, skyward soared to the landing place in the snow-covered mountains by the cedar forest the brother and sister went. On the great stone platform, the skyship landed. To Enlil's abode they went. Once inside, Enlil embraced her. With fervor, he kissed Nenma. Oh, my sister, my beloved. Enlil to her whispered. By her loins, he grabbed her. Into her womb, his semen he did not pour. Of our son Ninurta, word I bring you, Nenma to him said softly. A young prince he is. For adventure, he is ready. To join you on earth, he is prepared. If here you stay, let us, Ninurta our son, bring over. Enlil said to her. Enlil to her said, To the landing place, heroes were arriving. Rocket ships by sky ships to the platform they carried. From the pouch of Nimma, the seeds were obtained. In the valley's soil, they were sown. A fruit from Nibiru on earth to be grown. In the sky ship, Enlil to Nimma to Iridu return. On the way, Enlil to her, the landscape showed. The Eden's extent to her. Yeah, the Eden's extent to her, he showed. From the skies, Enlil to her, his plans explained. An everlasting plan have I designed to her, he was saying. That which for all time construction shall determine, I have laid out. Away from Eridu, where dry land begins, my quarters shall be. Larsa will be its name, a place for directing it shall become. On the banks of the Boranu, the, deep, the river of deep waters, it will be located. A twin thereof, a city shall in future arise, Lagash, I shall name it. Between the two on the plans, a line have I drawn. Sixty leagues thereafter, a healing city shall come into being. A city of your own, it shall be. Sherubak, the haven city, I shall name it. On the center line, it shall be located. To the fourth city, it shall be leading. Nibiru Ki, earth's crossing place, I will name it, a bond, heaven, earth, in it I shall establish. The tablets of destinies, it shall house, all missions it will control. With Eridu, five cities there shall be counted, to eternity they shall exist. On a crystal tablet, Enlil to Nenma, the master plan was showing. On the tablet, she saw more, mar she saw more markings of them, of Enlil, she inquired. Beyond the five cities, a chariot place I shall henceforth build from Nibiru to earth directly to arrive. Enlil to her was responding. Why by Anu's plans for Lamu, Enlil was bewildered. Nenma then understood. My brother, magnificent is your plan for five for the five cities. To him, Nenma was saying, the creation of Shurubak, a city for healing, as my abode for my own to be, is a matter of which grateful I am. Beyond that plan, do not transgress your father. Your brother, too, do not offend. You are wise as well as beautiful, Enlil said to her. And the Abzu, Inki, plans was also conceiving where to build his house, wherefore heroes' dwellings to prepare were the bowels of the earth to enter. In his skyship, to the extent of the Abzu, he measured. Its district he did carefully survey. A distant land the Abzu was, beyond the waters from the Eden it was away. A rich land it was, bursting with riches, perfect in fullness, Mighty rivers rushed across the region. Great waters there rapidly flowed. An abode by the flowing waters, Inky for himself established. To the midst of the Abzu, to a place of pure waters, Inky betook himself. In that land, the place of deepness, Inky determined. For the heroes into earth's bowels to descend. The earth splitter, Inky there established. Therewith in the earth a gash to make, by way of tunnels 
earth's inwards to reach the golden veins to uncover. Nearby, that which crunches and that which crushes, he emplaced. He emplaced the gold bearing oars to crunch and crush by sky ships to be carried to the landing place in the cedar mountains to be bought therefrom by rocket ships to the way station on Lamu to be transported. On earth, more heroes were arriving. Some to the Eden were assigned. Some in the Abzu tasks were given. Larsa and Lagash by Enlil were constructed. Sherubak for Ninma he did establish. With her therein, a host of female healers were dwelling, young ones who give succor. In Nib in the in Nibru Ki Enlil, a bond heaven earth was assembling a, a heaven earth bond, some kind of connection from the heaven to earth. That's what he was establishing there, like a port for ascension and for coming and going to ascend from here to there. Read it. May peace, purpose, protection, and prosperity be with you all this day as well. In Nibru Ki Enlil, a bond heaven earth was assembling. From there, all missions took command. Between Iridu and the Abzu, Enki was journeying back and forth for supervising he went. On Lamu, construction was progressing. Heroes for the way station were also arriving. A shar, two shars were the preparations lasting. Then Anu gave the word. On earth, the seventh day it was, a day of resting by Enki at the beginning decreed. At every place the heroes were assembled, a message from Anu from Nibiru being they overheard. In the Eden they were assembled, Enlil was there in command. With him was Ninma, her host of young ones by her side were assembled. Alagar, who of Iridu was the mat the mat I'm sorry. Alagar, who of Iridu was the master. Okay. I'm reading it like too slow. Okay. Alagar, who of the Eden was the master, was there. Abgal, who the landing place commanded, also stood. In the Abzu, where the heroes assembled, under the gaze of Enki, they stood. With Enki was his vizier, Ismud. Nungal, the pilot, was there too. On Lamu, the heroes were assembled. With their proud commander, Anzu, they stood. Six six hundred were on earth, three hundred on Lamu were gathered. In all, there were nine hundred. The words of Anu the king they all heard. Heroes of Nibiru, you are the saviors. The fate of all is in your hands. You, your success shall for eternity be recorded. By glorious names you shall be called. Those who on earth are shall as Anunnaki be known those who from heaven to earth came. Those who on Lamu are, Ejiji, shall be named. Those who observe and see, they shall be. Okay, so those who came down here to have sex with the women of the earth are known as the Anunnaki. The watchers, which we read about in the book of Enoch, which we, in the book of Enoch, we hear about the different classes, but they name them different things. They call them the watchers and a couple other ones that I forget. But it's the watchers who are known as the Ejiji in here, right? Okay, I'll read that again. Your success shall for eternity be recorded. By glorious names you shall be called. Those who on earth are shall as an Anunnaki be known. Those who from heaven to earth came, those who on Lamu are, EGG shall be named. Those who observe and see, they shall be. All that is required is ready. Let the goal start coming. Let Nibiru be saved. So as I read through this, I haven't quite, I'm not for sure that if the whole salvation portion that has come about that we hear about in a different fashion today, originally started with 
the what they're talking about here and what needed to be saved, like Nibiru, Levine, blessing, Shayla, blessing, the Twabu, right? Okay, so I'm still trying to figure it out. We still got the whole Anunnaki Bible to go through with all the other different tablets. So I'm trying to decide if we can go right into that after we read this or it's a couple other ones that's in the running with other tablets. I'm trying to decipher which one. So while we're reading through this, I'm going through those as well to see how it lines up the best way. Okay, the next section. Now this is the account of Enki and Enlil and Ninma, their loves and espousals, and by their sons, the rivalries. Offspring of Anu, the three leaders were, by different mothers were they born. Enki was the firstborn, a concubine of Anu was his mother. Enlil, by Antu, the spouse of Anu, was born, the legal heir he thus became. Ninma, by another concubine, was mother, a half-sister to the half to the two half-brothers she was. The firstborn daughter of Anu she was, by her name title, Ninma, this was indicated. Greatly beautiful she was, full of wisdom, one quick to learn. Ea, as Enki then was named, by Anu to espouse Ninma was chosen. Thereby their offspring, son, the legal successor, thereafter to become. Ninma of Enlil, a dashing commander, was enamored. By him she was seduced, into her womb his semen he poured. A son from Enlil's seed she bore. Ninurta, the two. Okay, I was reading, about to read it too slow. Okay. A son from Enlil's seed she bore. Ninurta, the two have named him. By the deed was Anu angered as punishment. He, Ninma, ever to be a spouse forbade. Let me go back. By the deed, hold on. Okay, a son from Enlil's seed she bore, Ninurta the two have named him. By the deed was Anu angered as punishment he, Ninma, ever to be a spouse forbade. <clears throat> Ea, his bride to be, by Anu's decree abandoned, a princess named Damka he instead espoused. A son and heir to them was born, Marduk they named him, one in a pure place born, it meant. As for Enlil, a son not by espousal he had, a spouse by his side to be he did not have. It was on earth, not on the Biru. This child of mine is upstairs. He can come down here. Sorry, y'all. As for Enlil, a son not by espousal he had, a spouse by his side to be he did not have. It was on earth, not on Nibiru, that Enlil became a spouse. The account of that is one of rape and exile and love that brought forgiveness, and of more sons that were only half-brothers. On earth, it was summer. To his abode in the cedar forest, Enlil retreated. In the forest, in the cedar forest, was Enlil walking in the cool of the day. In a cool mountain stream, some of Ninma's young ones to the landing place assigned were bathing. So when it said, you probably caught on by now, but when it says young ones, Jeremiah, hold on, I don't want to scream y'all here. One second. These coaches out here. Why he was calling me. <laughs> okay. On earth, it was summer. To his abode in the cedar forest, Enlil retreated. 
in the cedar forest was Enlil walking in the cool of the day. In a cool mountain stream, some of Ninma's young ones to the landing place assigned were bathing. So before I get up, young ones are the young women that came with Ninma. These are all the women that have been trained Mom, under under her command. Yes. Daddy get back in you, in you. The next week can go to the hotel. Yes, we'll be leaving in a few hours. Yeah. We, 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 we know, we actually leaving this house? Yes, we're leaving this house. I mean, we're coming back. We're just going for the weekend, Sudi. She like, Mom, yes. Mom, we can stay there five, four minutes. Yeah, we'll be there more than five minutes. Okay, and so. We, let's get some food, too. We're going to get some food, too, Sudi. So when you hear young ones, just know it's talking about the women, right? And they were, they were trained under her command, so they were healers. They were very well uh, learned in herbs and, and all kind of healing arts and everything, okay? In the cedar forest was Enlil walking in the cool of the day. In a cool mountain stream, some of Ninma's young ones to the landing place assigned were bathing by the beauty and grace of one. Sud was her name. Enlil was enchanted. To his cedar wood abode, Enlil invited. I'm sorry. To his cedar wood abode, Enlil, her invited. Come, partake with me in the elixir of Nibiru's fruit that grew here. So to her, he said. Sud, into Enlil's abode, entered. The elixir in a cup to her, Enlil presented. Siyemi Kimuntu Kikuyu, star 87. So it drank, Enlil drank too. To her, Enlil of intercourse was speaking. Unwilling was the last. My vagina is too little. It knows not copulation. To Enlil, she was saying. To her, Enlil of kissing was speaking. Unwilling was the last. My lips are too small. They know not kissing. To Enlil, she was saying. Enlil laughed and embraced her. He laughed and he kissed her. His semen into her womb, he poured. I guess he right quickly fixed that. <laughs> she said, uh, it's too small. Oh, drink some of this elixir, sis. We're going to get you right. Enlil, y'all about to see Enlil and his shenanigans. They, they, this is where they start, okay? His semen into her womb, he poured. To Nenma, Sud's commander, the immortal, the immoral deed was reported. Enlil, immoral one, for your deed, judgment you shall face. So did Ninma to Enlil in anger say. In the presence of fifty Anunnaki, seven who judge were assembled. Seven who judge on Enlil a punishment Saying decree. Okay, son. Yeah, hurry up. <laughs> he waiting for you. Sud who judge on earth, I'm sorry, seven who judge on, hold on, seven who judge on Enlil a punishment decreed. Let Enlil from all cities be banished to a land of no return. Let him be exiled. In a sky chamber, they made Enlil leave the landing place. Abigail was its pilot. To a land of no return, Enlil was taken never to return in the sky chamber the two of them journeyed to another land was their direction there amidst forbid forbidding mountains a place at a place of desolation abgal the sky chamber landed this is your place this your place of exile shall be abgal to enlil was saying not perchance have i it chosen to enlil he was saying a secret of Inky in it is hidden. In the nearby cave, Inky, seven weapons of terror were hidden. From Alalu's celestial chariot, he had them removed. Take the weapons into your possession. With the weapons, your freedom attain. So was Abgal to his commander saying, A secret of Inky to Enlil he did reveal. Yes. What? What, girl? What you forget? Next, next Saturday, don't you go? Next week, can leave? Uh, not yet. I still gotta pack y'all bags and I need to go to the store and then we're gonna leave. Okay, I can go with you. Yeah, yes. Okay, 
go upstairs with that. I need to Okay. Not perchance have I it chosen to Enlil, he was saying. A secret of Inki in it is hidden. In the nearby cave, Inki, seven weapons of terror, was hidden. From Alalu's celestial chariot, he had, he had them removed. Take the weapons into your possession. With the weapons, your freedom attained. So was Abgal to his commander, saying, A secret of Inki to Enlil, he did reveal. Then from the secret place, Abgal departed, and Lil alone was there left. In the Eden, said to Ninma, her commander, words were speaking, By Enlil's seed am I pregnant, a child of Enlil in my womb has been conceived. Ninma, said's words to Inki conveyed, The Lord of earth he was, on earth he was supreme. They summoned Sud before seven who judged, Will you take Enlil as your spouse? They, her ass. I'm trying to make apple slices. Wait a minute, Tootie. Don't mess with that. Please. Go ask Dad to come here. Go ask Dad to come here. Because that, no, the thing in there is sharp. And that's, that chop up like onions and stuff. You want the apple slicer, not that. Go tell Dad I said come here. Well, you don't really want him then, girl. Okay. They summoned, so I'm going to call dad myself. You go call him and let him do it. I don't want you messing with that. They summoned, so before seven who judge, will you take Enlil as your spouse? They, her ass. Words of consent she uttered. The words of Abgal to Enlil in his exile were conveyed. To his spouse, Sud, Enlil from his exile was returned. By that did Enki and Ninma to him a pardon give. Enlil's official spouse, Sud, was declared on her the name title Ninlil, Lady of the Command, was bestowed. Thereafter to Ninlil and Enlil, a son was born, Ninar, the bright one, Ninlil, Ninlil him named. I'm tongue tied, y'all. He was the first of the Anunnaki on earth to be conceived one of Nibiru's royal seed on an alien planet to be born. It was after that that Enki to Ninma was speaking, come be with me in the Abzu. In the midst of the Abzu, a place of pure waters and abode I have established with a bright metal, silver is its name. It is embellished with a deep blue stone, lapis lazuli, it is adorned. Come Ninma. Be with me, your adoration of Enlil abandoned. To the Abzu, to the abode of Enki, Ninma then journeyed. Enki there to her words of loving spoke. Of how for each other intended, sweet words to her he whispered. You are still my beloved to her, he said caressing. He embraced her, he kissed her. She caused his phallus to water. Enki, his semen into the womb of Ninma, he poured. Give me a son. Give me a son, he cried out. This gets rather, uh, you know, y'all see already. She took the semen into her womb, the semen of Enki, her impregnated. One day of Nibiru was a month of earth for her. Two days, three days, four days of Nibiru, like months of earth they were. Five and six and seven and eight days of months were completed. Were completed. The ninth count of motherhood was completed. Ninma was in travail. So for every month, it was a day for um, Nibiru. So if they were on Nibiru and she was pregnant... In nine days, she would have given birth. But remember, Earth's, Earth's time is sped up compared to Nibiru. So every day is a month in Earth's time. Is this when they came down and had sex with, with the women and had giants? Yes, all of this, what we read in Genesis is it's just lumped together. It just says they came down, had sex with the women, taught them things, and boom. But this is giving the details of which ones had sex with which ones like the book of Enoch sort of kind of give you the details of you're going to see it because you're going to start it's going to you're going to start getting um 
if you're familiar with the book of Enoch, as we go on from this point, you're going to start recognizing some of the things. You're going to start recognizing some of the names. So, um, that you hear like some, 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 some Yaza, you want to hear that name. And if you're familiar with the other names that came down that made the pack together, the 200, they talk about them in here too. So keep listening. You're going to, you're going to start seeing where this was pulled from. And you're like, well, hold on a minute. Okay, Alicia, call me so we can talk about the time difference. Yes. And it, okay. Yeah. Okay. One day of Nibiru was a month of earth for her. Two days, three days, four days of Nibiru, like months of earth they were. Five and six and seven and eight days of months were completed. The ninth count of motherhood was completed. Ninma was in travail. To a child she gave birth. The newborn was a female on the banks of the river and the Abzu, a daughter to Enki and Ninma was born. Enki, by a daughter, was disappointed. Kiss the young one to him, Nenma said. Kiss the young one, Enki to his vizier, Ismut said. A son I desire. A son by my half-sister I must have. Again, he kissed Nenma. By her loins, he grabbed her. His semen into her womb, he poured. And again, she was, and again, she was with child. Again, a daughter to Enki she bore. A son, a son by you I must have. Enki to her cried out. Ninma he kissed again. Thereupon Ninma against Enki a cursing uttered. Whatever food he ate was poison in his innards. His jaw hurt, his tooth hurt, his ribs were hurting. Izimud the Anunnaki summoned to Ninma for relief. They were pleading. So mind you, let's just bring it back up. Bring you back up to speed, just in case you forgot. Remember, uh, Ninma is the leader of all the women from uh, Nibiru, right? They were, they were what you call, I, and today they will probably call them witches, but we would call them Mom. master herbalists, Mom. right? All everything Mom. they understood yesterday. Can I get some crackers? Go ahead. Wait, hold on. Wait, it's crackers up there. What are you, what are you trying to get them from? Crackers. They're not up there. I think the only crackers we have left because Dad ate the rest of the saltines with his stuff. Um, it's oyster crackers. They kind of tiny to dip. You want the oyster crackers? Give me a second. Y'all. Let's see if you get past dad with that. I ain't gonna tell you you can't. If dad lets you stay, you better sit on the foot locker. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. So he wanted to have a son by his half sister, so the child, the male child produced by her, would have the throne. And he would literally, he would be another one. Uh, uh, Nibiruin, who was born on earth, but he fully Anunnaki or Nibiruin blood. That's why he wanted her, wanted a son by his half sister. They got different mothers, but they got the same daddy, which is why Anu was pissed with um, Inky and his loose ways, right? So, um, he kept going, he kept going after her, and she got pissed. He didn't get, oh, you came back down here to tell me dad didn't get you? All right, sis, go. I was Go ahead. So he kept, so he was pumping her up, getting her pregnant like every nine days, every nine days. And she was getting tired of it. He was like, a son, a son, you must give me. He just took her and just kept pumping her up. And so she got tired of it and she cursed him. That's what it said. She cursed him. So every time he would eat anything, it would poison his inwards. It made his mouth hurt. All these things. Okay. So let me go back. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read this again. On the banks of the river in the Abzu, a daughter to Enki and Ninma was born. 
Enki, by a daughter, was disappointed. Kiss the young one to him, Nenma said. Kiss the young one, Enki, to his vizier, Ismut said. A son I desire. A son by my half-sister I must have. When the baby came out, kiss your daughter. He turned to his friend. He said, kiss her. I wanted a son. Enki, by a daughter, was disappointed. Kiss the young one to him, Nenma said. Kiss the young one, Enki, to his vizier, Ismut said. A son I desire. A son by my half-sister I must have. Again, he kissed Nenma by her loins. He grabbed her, his semen into her womb he poured. Again, she was with child. Again, a daughter to Enki she bore. A son, a son by you I must have. Enki to her cried out. Nenma he kissed again. Thereupon, Nenma against Enki a cursing uttered. Whatever food he ate was poisoned in his innards. His jaw hurt, his tooth hurt, his ribs were hurting. Isma the Anunnaki summoned to Nenma for relief. They were pleading to distance himself from Nenma's vulva. Enki, by raised arms, swore. I promise I won't try and take none no more. Just please stop all the pain, right? Kim, shalom, shalom. <laughs> Show us it. Oh, my, clutching my pearls. Right, the first time I read, I'm like, ooh, what? Let me check. What am I reading again? Pay attention, y'all. Listen. A son, a son by you I must have. Enki to her cried out. Nenma he kissed again. Thereupon Nenma against Enki a cursing uttered. Whatever food he ate was poison in his innards. His jaw hurt. His tooth hurt. His ribs were hurting. Izimud the Anunnaki summoned to Nenma for relief. They were pleading to distance himself from Nenma's vulva. Enki by raised arm swore. I swear. One by one she his ailments removed. From her curse, Enki was freed. To the Eden, Nenma returned, never to be his spouse. Anu's command was fulfilled. To Earth, Enki, his spouse, Dam Dam Damkina, with their son Marduk, summoned. Ninki, Lady of Earth, the title she was granted by her and by concubines. Enki, five more sons had. These were their names. Nergal and Gibil, Ninagal and Ningishida, and Dumuzi, the youngest, to earth Enlil and Ninma, their son Ninurta summoned. By his spouse, Ninlil, did Enlil one more son have, to Nanar, a full brother. Ishkur was his name. Three sons in all did Enlil have, none by concubines were they born. Two clans were thus on earth established. Their rivalries to war did lead. Now this is the account of the mutiny of the Ijiji and how Anzu to death was put for stealing the tablets of destinies punished. From the Abzu, gold from earth's veins to the landing place was carried. Thence Ijiji and rocket ships to the way station on Lamu transported. From the planet Lamu in celestial chariots was the precious metal to Nibiru board. On Nibiru was the gold to the finest dust fashion. To protect the atmosphere, it was employed. Slowly was the breach in the heavens healing. Slowly was Nibiru saved. In the Eden, five cities were perfected. Enki and Iridu, a sparkling abode made upon soil skyward raised, he built it. Like a mountain, he raised it above the ground. In a good place, he built it. Damkina, his spouse, therein dwelt. To his son Marduk, Enki was there wisdom teaching. In, Nib in Nibruki, Enlil, the bond heaven earth established, a sight to see it was. At its center, a heavenward tall pillar, the sky itself was reaching. On a platform that cannot be overturned, it was placed. Therewith, the words of Enlil, all settlements encompassed. On Lamu and in Nibiru, they were heard. From there, beams were raised, the heart of all the lands they could search. Its eyes could, its eyes could scan all the lands, its net unwanted approach impossible made. 
in its lofty house, a crown-like chamber was the center. To distant heavens it peered. Toward the horizon was its gaze, the heavenly zenith it perfected. In its dark hollow chamber by twelve emblems was the family of the sun marked. On me's, or M-E apostrophe S, on me's were the secret formulas of sun and moon, Nibiru and earth, and eight celestial gods recorded. The tablets of destinies in the chamber their hues emitted, with them in Lil all comings and goings oversaw. On earth the Anunnaki toiled of work and sustenance they were complaining. By earth's quick cycles they were disturbed. Of the elixir they only small rations were given. So this elixir that they bought, that the women bought with them, it was apparently the, the food or whatever they ate um, in Nibiru, right? Whatever the drink was, it, it kept them, I don't know, it kept them in their godlike state, so to speak. Because when they came to earth, their whole body, everything was uh, starting to be upset after being on earth for long periods of time. So it's like the, the, the fountain of youth or the... The, e the eternal life elixir that they're drinking. And you're going to see as we go that they said no humans could drink it. Otherwise, it would give them eternal life, right? So which is why even when they take some of their human offspring back to Nibiru, just for a quick visit, they say you got to go back to Earth. Otherwise, you, we're going to need to give you this and then you would live forever. And they did, just really didn't trust the humans like that for real, right? They had their own shenanigans going on within the God family. We don't need more, you know. You'll see. I'm going to quit talking and read. Okay. The tablets of destinies in the chamber, their hues emitted with them in Lil, all comings and goings oversaw. On earth, the Anunnaki toil of work and sustenance, they were complaining. By earth's quick cycles, they were disturbed. Of the elixir, they only small rations were given. In the Eden, the Anunnaki toil. In the Abzu, the work was more backbreaking. By teams were Anunnaki sent back to Nibiru. By teams, new ones were arriving. The Ejiji on Lamu dwelling were the loudest in complaining. When from Lamu to earth they descend, a rest place on earth they were demanding. With Anu did Enlil and Inki words exchange, the king they consulted. Let the leader come to earth with Anzu have discussions. So did Anu say to them, Anzu to earth from the heavens descended, the words of complaints to Enlil and Inki he delivered. Let Anzu of the workings gain understanding. Enki to Enlil was saying, I will the Abzu to him show you the bond heaven earth to him reveal. To the words of Enki, Enlil consented. Enki to Anzu, the Abzu did show the toil in the mines to him he presented. Enlil, Anzu, Enlil, Anzu to Nibru Ki invited to the hollow dark chamber he let him enter. In the innermost sanctuary, the tablets of destinies to Anzu, he explained what the Anunnaki and the five cities were doing to Anzu was shown. To the Ejiji, who were at the landing place, were arriving relief, he promised. To discuss the complaints of the Ejiji, he to Nibru Ki then returned. A prince among the princes was Anzu, of royal seed, his ancestry he counted. Evil thoughts filled his heart with the bond, heaven, earth, he returned. To take away the tablets of destinies, he was scheming. And every time, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure. But I'm thinking the tablets, the tablets of destinies, I want to say is what we know as the breastplate that the priests wore with the 12 stones. If, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's, um, I got to go back and read. I was reading another portion of it and I'm leaning more towards it. Which one was I reading? I think it was the wars of gods and men. Another one that has more detail 
of what happened as well. Um, but don't quote me on it. But at this point, I could be wrong, but I could be right. I'm thinking the Tablets of Destinies is what we know as the priest's breastplate with the 12 different um, um, jewels that represent each tribe. <clears throat> I think. I think. Don't quote me yet. I'm going to let y'all know. Enlil thoughts filled his heart. When to the bond, heaven, earth, he returned to take away the tablets of destinies he was scheming of the decrees of heaven and earth to take control in his heart. He was planning the removal of the Enlil ship in his heart. He conceived to rule Ijiji and Anunnaki was his aim. Unsuspecting Enlil at the entrance to the sanctuary, Anzu let be stationed. Unsuspecting Enlil left the sanctuary for a cooling swim, he went away. With evil purpose, Anzu, the tablets of destinies, seized. In a sky chamber, he flew away. To the mountain of the sky chambers, he swiftly went. There, in the landing place, rebellious Ijiji were for him waiting. To declare Anzu, king of the earth, and Lamu, they were preparing. In the sanctuary of Nibruki, the brilliance petered out. The humming quieted down. Silence in the place prevailed. Suspended were the sacred formulas. In, the, in Nibru Key, Enlil was speechless. By the treachery, he was overwhelmed. To Enki, angry words he spoke. Of the, of the ancestry of Anzu, he him questioned. In Nibru Key, the leaders gathered. The Anunnaki who decree fates with Anu were consulting. Anzu must be seized. The tablets to the sanctuary must be returned. Thus did Anu decree. Who shall the rebel face? Who shall the tablets retrieve? The leaders asked each other. With the tablets of destinies in his possession, invincible is Anzu. To each other they were saying. Ninurta by his mother encouraged. Ninurta by his mother encouraged from the assembled step forward. Enlil's warrior I shall be, Anzu I shall vanquish. Thus was Ninurta saying. To the mountainside, Ninurta set his course to vanquish the fugitive Anzu he undertook. Anzu from his hideout, Ninurta was mocking. The tablets are my protection. Invincible I am. Lightning darts Ninurta at Anzu directed. The arrows could not approach Anzu. Backward they turned. The battle was stilled. Ninurta's weapons, Anzu did not vanquish. Enki then to Ninurta gave counsel. With your whirlwind, stir up a storm. Let the dust cover Anzu's face. Let it the wings of his sky bird ruffle. So when I start reading through this, I start thinking about some of the Marvel movies and some of the powers that the women have. I'm like, yo, I started thinking about Storm. And so when certain things they require, they look to the women. It seemed not that the men don't have powerful weapons and stuff, but it seemed like the women like kind of like are more so the ones controlling the elements, right? Anything that got to do with the, the four elements, the herbs or whatever, anything that the men need fashion, they go to the women. Yo, whip me up this so I can go. And they just, you know, which which makes me think about how women cook. Not that men don't cook. Hear what I'm saying. But as I'm looking at all, the, all this, I'm looking at how each sex was created and the different things that, Men do better than women and women do better than men. And even how through this, you can see it and who goes to who for what. I'm like, you know, th this is getting good. Okay. On the mountainside, Ninurta set his course to vanquish the fugitive Anzu he undertook. Anzu from his hideout, Ninurta was mocking. The tablets are my protection. Invincible I am. Lightning darts, Ninurta at Anzu directed. The arrows could not approach Anzu. Backward they turned. The battle was stilled. Ninurta's weapons, Anzu did not vanquish. Enki then to Ninurta gave counsel. With your whirlwind, stir up a storm. Let the dust cover Anzu's face. Let it the wings of his sky bird ruffle. For his son Enlil, a mighty weapon fashion. A Tilu missile it was. To your stormer weapon, attach it. 
when wing to wing near at Anzu shoot it. Let me read that again. For his son Enlil, a mighty weapon fashion, a Tilu missile it was. To your stormer weapon, attach it. When wing to wing near at Anzu, shoot it. Thus did Enlil his son Ninurta instruct. When wing to wing near each other, let the missile fly as a lightning. Again, Ninurta in his whirlwind sword, Anzu against him. In his skybird rose to challenge. Wing to wing, Anzu in anger shouted, This battle will be your destruction. Jan Shalom. Ninurta, the advice of Inki followed. With his whirlwind, a dust storm he creates it. And Ninurta here is a dude, but you'll see what I'm talking about when we get further on. The dust Anzu's face covered. The pinions of his skybird were exposed. Into their midst, the Nurta, the missile let loose. A fiery brilliance, Anzu's pinions engulfed. Like butterflies, his wings began to flutter. To the ground, Anzu came falling. The earth shook. The skies became darkened. The fallen Anzu, Ninurta made captive, made captive. From him, the tablets he retrieved. From the mountaintop, the Ijiji were watching. When to the landing place, Ninurta came. They trembled and kissed his feet. Ninurta, the captive Abgal and Anunnaki set free. To Anu and Enlil, his victory he announced. To Nibru Ki, he then returned. In its inmost chamber, the tablets were reinstalled. Once again, the brilliance therein returned. The hum of Mies in the tablets was restored. Before the seven who judged, Anzu for judgment was taken. Enlil and Ninlil, his spouse, Enki and his spouse, Ninki, the one beforehand was Damkina known. And the sons of Ninar and Marduk were there. Ninma also was in the judging. Ninurta of the evil deeds spoke. There was no justification. Let death be the penalty, he said. The EGG by right were complaining. A rest place on earth they do need. Marduk encounter argue. Who down here? Who in there? Isaiah. Somebody keep them. It's one of them children. Hold on. They keep throwing something. Maybe I'm tripping. Ain't nobody in there. But somebody keep throwing something. I ain't gonna trip out while we're reading. I know y'all heard that. It, let me keep reading. Let me find my spot. Okay. The Ijiji by right were complaining. A rest place on earth they do need. Marduk encounter argued. By his evil deed, all the Anunnaki and Ijiji and Zu did endanger, Enlil said. Enki and Ninma with Enlil agreed. The evil must be extinguished, they said. By death, the execute to death by execution. The seven judged Anzu. With a killing ray, Anzu's life breath was extinguished. Let his body to the vultures be left, Ninurta said. Let him on Lamu be buried in the cave next to Alalu be laid to rest, Enki was saying. From the same ancestrals, from the same ancestral seed, the two of them were. Let Marduk the body to Lamu carry. Let Marduk there as commander stay. So Enki to the judges suggesting let it so be and lil said now this is the account of how bad tibera the metal city was established and how in the 40th shar the anunnaki in the abzu mutiny in the 25th shar was anzu judged and executed 
the unrest of the Ijiji, it's it subdued, but it I'm sorry. The unrest of the Ijiji, it subdued, but left it simmering. To Lamu, Marduk was sent, the spirits of the Ijiji to raise, to their well being, pay attention. On earth, changes were by Enlil and Inky discussed to avoid unrest on earth they were considering. The stays on earth are too prolonged to each other, they were saying. Ninma for counsel, they asked. By her changing visage, they were alarmed. Gold to Nibiru must more quickly flow. Salvation must faster be provided, they all agreed. Ninurta, in the innards of planets, learned was, to his elders, words of wisdom, he was saying, let a metal city be established, therein the gold ores to be smelted and refined. Therefrom, less weighty cargoes from earth shall be lofted. Each rocket ship more gold could carry. Room for Anunnaki to Nibiru, return there shall be. Let the tired to Nibiru return. Let fresh, run, let fresh ones them on earth replace. Enlil and Inki and Ninma of Ninurta's suggestion were in favor. And Nu was consulted and his approval gave. In the Eden was the metal city plan. On that location, Enlil did insist. With materials from Nibiru was it constructed. With tools from Nibiru was it equipped. Three shards, the construction lasted. Bad Tibira was the name given. Ninurta, who made the suggestion. What the crap? Hold on, y'all. I'm about to pluck my nerves right now because ain't nobody down here with me. Hey, babe. James. Are the kids Y'all, oh, let me do a quick prayer. Okay. Hey, what are the kids doing? That's crazy. Y'all better playing with me. All right, y'all. That was loud that time, y'all. Y'all, maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm hearing something else. But it was loud. It sounded like somebody is down here playing. But no, none of my kids are down here. I don't know. Let me pay close attention. Okay. I keep losing my spot. Hold on. Okay. In the Eden was the metal city plan. On that location, Enlil did insist. With materials from Nibiru, was it constructed? With tools from Nibiru, was it equipped? Three shards, the construction lasted. Bad Tibiru, was it the name given? Ninurta, who made the suggestion, was its first commander. The flow of gold to Nibiru was thereby eased and quickened. Those who to earth and Lamu at the beginning of prior times had come to Nibiru were returning. Alagar and Avgal and Nungal among them were. The newcomers who them replaced were younger and eager to the cycles of earth and Lamu and the other rigors they were not accustomed. On Nibiru, whence they I'm had come. Are you your told. brothers woke? Huh? Your brothers woke? Where are they going? No, are they woke or are they still sleep? They still sleep. They still sleep. You was in the room with dad? No, I was in the boys' room. What were you doing in the boys' room? Just watching something on my... Oh, I turned the switch. You weren't playing with any toys? No? Okay. <laughs> no, that's Jeremiah. That's the front door. All right, just enough. <laughs> hey, see, I need that extra practice. I'm going to need you to help me drive. Uh, look. I need that extra practice because I was extra shaky on the express. All right, you always going to be shaky the first few times on the express. Mm -hmm. Chill out. I'm almost done, y'all. Chill. Mom. What, Pooh? After, after, after me and you go to the store, I can come and see you, Jeremiah. Uh, we're not going today, Pooh. Okay, y'all, back up. Come on, come on. The newcomers who replaced them were younger and eager 
to the cycles of earth and Lamu and the other rigors they were not accustomed. On Nibiru, whence they had come, the breach in the atmosphere was healing. The great calamities on the planet and in its heavens, the younger ones did not know. Of their golden mission, excitement, and adventure, they especially cherished. As by an inert to conceive, the ores from the Abzu were delivered. In Bat-Tabira, they were smelted and refined. By rocket ships to Lamu, they were sent. In celestial chariots from Lamu to Nibiru was the pure gold delivered. As by an inert to conceive, from the Abzu to Nibiru, the gold flowed. What was not conceived was unrest by the new coming and Anaki, who in the Abzu toiled. Truth be said, Inky, oh, we almost done. We only got like a couple pages. Okay. Truth be said, Inky to what was brewing he was not giving. To other matters in the Abzu, his attention was directing. With that which in the Abzu grows, the lives fascination he acquired of the differences between what on earth and what on Nibiru appeared he wished to learn how miladies by earth's cycles and atmosphere were caused he wished to uncover in the Abzu by the gushing waters a wondrous study place he erected with all manner of tools and equipment he furnished it house of life he called the place to it, his son, Ningishida, he invited. Sacred formulas, tiny emmies, the secrets of life and death, possessing, they shaped. The mysteries of living and dying of Earth's creatures, they, to unravel, sought. With some living creatures, Inki was especially enamored. They lived among the tall trees. Their front legs and hands were they were using. In the tall grasses of the steppes, Odd creatures were seen, erect, they seemed to be walking. Absorbed was Inky in those studies. What was among the Anunnaki brewing, he noticed not. First to notice trouble was Ninurta, a lessening of gold ores at Batibra, he observed. By Enlil was Ninurta to the Abzu dispatch, what was ongoing to discover. By Enugi, the chief officer, to the excavations, he was accompanied. Complaints of the Anunnaki, he with his own ears heard. They were backbiting and lamenting in the excavations. They were grumbling. Unbearable is the toil to Ninurta, they were saying. Ninurta to his uncle Inki reported. Let us Enlil summon, Inki said. Enlil and the Abzu arrived in a house near the excavations he was stationed. Let us unnerve Inki in his dwelling. Mine workers, heroes, shouted, of the heavy work, let him relieve us. Let us proclaim war with hostilities. Let us gain relief, others shouted. So this right here, the Anunnaki working in the um in the, the mines, trying to mine the gold, reminds me of the Hebrew slaves in Egypt. I'm just like, I, this this story, it sounds really familiar. And some of the cries, they're just crying out to a different person, right? They're crying out to Inky, get Enlil's attention, free us. The, the work is backbreaking, right? But these were these were gods, right? They were gods. They come from Nibiru, right? Okay. Unbearable is the toil to Ninurta, they were saying. Ninurta, this to his uncle Inky, reported let us Enlil summon, Inky said. Enlil and the Abzu arrived in a house near the excavations he was stationed. Let us unnerve Enlil in his dwelling. Mine workers, heroes, shouted of the heavy work. Let him relieve us. Let us proclaim war with hostilities. Let us gain relief, others shouted. The Anunnaki and the excavations, the words of incitement heeded. Their tools, they set fire, fire to their axes they put. They troubled Inuji, chief officer of the mining, in the tunnels they seized him. They held him as they went to the doorwell of Enlil's dwelling. They made their way. It was night, halfway through the watch it was. Enlil's dwelling they surrounded, their tools as torches they high held. Kalkal, the gateway's guardian, bolted the door and Nusku aroused. Nusku, Enlil's vizier, roused his lord, get him out of bed, thus saying. 
My Lord, your house is surrounded. Battling and a knocky to your gate came up. Enlil summoned Enki. Enlil Ninurta summoned to his presence. What do my own eyes see? Is it against me that this thing is done? Thus was Enlil saying to them, Who is of the hostilities the instigator? The Anunnaki stood together. Every single one of us hostilities has declared. Excessive is the toil. Our work is heavy. Great is the distress. So they were to Enlil saying, Words of the happenings Enlil to Anu being. Of what is Enlil accused? Anu inquired. The work, not Enlil, is the troubling causing, Enki to Anu was saying. The lamentation is heavy. Every day the complaints we could hear. The goal must be obtained, Anu was saying. The work must continue. Release Enugi for consultations. Enlil to the hostile Anaki, Anunnaki said. Enugi was released to the leaders. He was the same. Ever since Earth's heat has been rising, the toil is excruciating, unbearable it is. Let the rebels to Nibiru return. Let new ones come in their stead, Ninurta said. Perchance new tools you can fashion, Enlil to Enki said, for the Anunnaki heroes, the tunnels to avoid. Let us summon my son, Ningishida, counsel with him I wish to take. Enki thus responded, they summoned Ningishida from the house of life he came. With him, Enki huddled. Words amongst them they exchanged. A solution is possible, Enki was saying. Let us create a Lulu, a primitive worker, the hardship work to take over. Let the being, the toil of the Anunnaki, carry on his back. Astounded were the besieged leaders. Speechless, indeed, they were. Whoever heard of a being, a fresh created, a worker who the Anunnaki's work can do? They summoned Ninma, one who of healing and succor was much knowing. Enki's words to her, they repeated. Whoever of such a thing heard, they her asked. The task is unheard of, she to Enki said. All beings from a seed have descended. One being from another over eons did develop. None from nothing ever came. How right you are, my sister, Enki said, smiling. A secret of the Abzu, let me to you all reveal. The being that we need, it already exists. All that we have to do is put a mark. All we have to do is put on it the mark of our essence. Thereby a Lulu, a primitive worker, shall be created. So did Enki to them say. Let us hereby a decision make, a blessing to my plan give, to create a primitive worker by the mark of our essence to fashion him. Mm, and that's where it ends today. So remember when they had banished Inky because he had he had committed rape. They said, send him up to the heavens. Give him a chariot up there. And you, you stay up there. You can't come over here no more. But when he had first came down, when Alalu had these weapons of mass destruction. When he saw them, he went and took them and he hid them in the heavens, wherever the portals were up there. He hid them up there. It's like another place, right? He took them and he hid them up there. So when they, when they banished him, he was close by the place where he had these weapons. But then when they found out that Sud was pregnant by him, they said, go get this dude. Then we're going to see if we can correct this and make this right. Okay. So you pregnant. I mean, what you want to do? You, you want to marry him? Well, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. Okay, so go get him. We forgive your indiscretion because she says she'll marry you, so this is your wife. Okay, we won't count it as rape, all this. Although you forced yourself on her, we'll forgive you because she says she'll take you. You know, so voila. So now he back in good graces with everybody. But while he was out there, he was he was searching around. He was looking at different things on earth. And he actually saw a creation. Remember it said he saw something. He saw a being and it looked upright. It walked on twos, right? He was distinguishing some of the animals. Some had four legs, but there was a being. And he said, he said a being 
that walked on twos, right? So tomorrow it's going to describe this being. If you read ahead, you will see. And as I read, I'm like, huh, that sounds like what scientists call the Neanderthal, right? And it's going to describe the type of hair, how it sounded, how it talked. It didn't talk. It just did like the grunts and stuff. But it was created with original creation from the, the great creator. They were created and they were there. They said the being we need already exists. We can just take some of our, our life force, our essence, and we can just put it into them. So they're going to try that. But then you're going to see how it expands. But we're going to get into a lot of that tomorrow in the sixth tablet. If you want to read ahead, go ahead or listen to it. It's on YouTube. Listen to it. If y'all got some questions, because I, I, I listened to it like three times already. I'm like, yo, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so this, this. And then I started thinking about some of my studies. And you go and look into some of the different skulls of the different races or whatever and just the different things and how they develop i say now you know what this makes a whole heck of a lot more sense than what they've ever taught us in the church so as they start going through this um their what i want to call it uh in their laboratory what they're doing you want to see how different beings were created right it it just it just it just makes what we see and we still have questions about. It makes it make Uncle JB. He said, I open it, isn't it? This is my uncle, the one that said, have you heard of Zachariah Sitchin? You know, and remember I told you at his name, that guy's name kept popping up while I was looking through something. And I just, I'm like, what does guy name keep popping up? And I just ignored it. I wasn't, I wasn't even going to click on it. Right. But then my uncle called me a couple days later and said, hey, ha I, I want you to say, get a pen and a piece of paper. I said, okay, you know, anytime he called, I'm like, all right, whatever he about to say is I, I, I need to, whatever, I'm listening. And so he said, write this down. And I wrote that. He said, you need to go look at this, go look at this and go look at this. And here's this guy's name. I said, okay. And I, I was scribbling it right on my piece of paper right here. As soon as I got off the phone, I went looking up and I told him, I said, wait a minute, that name, Zachariah Sitchin. I said, it's been popping up the last couple of days. Yeah, I'm familiar with the name, but I haven't read any of his stuff. He said, you need to go look at it. I'm like, okay y'all but i'm telling you start you can start pulling up some science or whatever looking into those skulls they got pictures and stuff where they showing different skulls from neanderthals different races just different things that they show but then i go and read this i was like wait a minute and immediately pictures pop in my mind because i'm i'm already like okay they say everybody came from one man and one woman. I said, that doesn't freaking make sense to me. I said, in theory, it sounds like a good theory. I said, but it doesn't account for the different skull structures, right? I said, how does that happen? I said, granted, they say the colors could come from, okay, well, you are you were in a more cold climate and your body just kind of acclimated to the weather there. So you began to lose pigmentation and you were in a hotter climate. So you got darker. Oh, okay. That, that sounds logical. I was like, but I'm, I, I, I may have been born yesterday, you know, but I mean, no, I said that wrong. I'm, I may have been just born, but I wasn't born yesterday. You know, I've, I've had a little bit of time here just to look at some stuff. I'm like, some of this stuff is not adding up. I was like, and the church is not giving me, even the Hebrew counts, y'all, y'all are not, no, y'all just want to pass theories down to me. But things that I can see, things that I can test, I can clearly tell. No, you did not come from, okay, these people, okay, so you can you can get white from black, but you can't get black from white. Um, okay, we can kind of see that. But uh, but some other thing, how do we how are we accounting for the thinner frame like the Asians and then you got the Africans and then you you got what they call native American, just a different structure like the skull the, what causes the skulls to change? Okay, you might be able to fool me with the skin color and stuff, but what causes the bone structures to change, at least in the skull? And in even like longer arms and stuff. I mean, I was like, something ain't right. Something is not adding up. But when I began to read this, I'm like, now, wait a minute. Because I was telling my sister last year when we was talking about this, and I got this simply from reading like Jubilees and Jasher. I'm like, Alicia, I say, if you go back and you read in, in, in Jubilees, I said, here and here, I said, um, this to me sounds like that there was more than one man and one woman that were created. 
And she was like, well, yeah, you kind of got a point. And it started talking about the classes. I'm like, yo, I said, if I didn't know any better, because I kept reading it over and over, I said, maybe I'm just reading too far into it. But because I had already read like a lot of other stuff, I'm like, this seems like this is saying something other than what they're telling me this is saying. I said, I, I can't quite put my hand on. I said, plus with all that we know, the, the, the science and the research and just look at us like, something ain't right. Everybody did not come from one woman. I said, I, I just can't believe that any longer. And it's going to have to be some very overwhelming information that causes me to step back and believe that what I've been taught. I was like, but based on like facts and findings and actual proof, I'm like, I just, I, we're going to put that on the table. I could, I still could be wrong. Everybody could descend from one woman. I said, but, uh, I got questions about this. Like, you need to give me more solid proof and just instead of just telling me that all life began on, on this continent, you know, and I, I just something is wrong about that. Something is not adding up, you know. What do you understand from Jubilee chapter one, verse 13? I don't remember exactly what Jubilee chapter one, verse 13 says. Uh, maybe you pop the scripture there so I can read it or I can look it up real quick. Trina, the food, the, the food, the food is the, 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 the variable. That's what they tell you. You know, food, food can only go so far. Food can only do so much. Right. But y'all gonna see what I'm talking about as we begin to get into some of the, as we get into the rest of the tablets, I'm like, you know what? Now that makes more sense than anything I've ever heard in my life. And something just feels right about this because all the questions I've already had before about the different races and the, 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 the skull structures and stuff like that. Right. So. All right. So that's what we'll pause at today. Like I said, y'all can read ahead. Go look into some of this stuff. Even pull up some science stuff. Just kind of have some stuff ready and just begin to like com compare some things. Right. At the very least, you start ask. You should start asking some questions. OK. We had an hour and 20 minutes. Let's just read a page of my big toe. I feel like I'm neglecting this. <laughs> okay. We pause. On page 134 at the last sentence on the page. And it's... Uh, one, two, two, four, six, eight. It's like eight pages of this left. So let me let me read a page or two. And then we'll pause. We won't go all the way to the end, but let me just, you know. All right, page 134, my big toe. The result of understanding, pro, I'm sorry. The result of understanding, appreciating, and accepting the limits of your knowledge is that you neither believe nor disbelieve much of the information that initially lies beyond your knowledge. Like, we just literally just talking about this, right? It's like, but okay. Judgment should be suspended until sufficient data are collected. Clearly is what I've done. What we were just talking about. The method of approaching information is called open-minded. The quality, rigor of the conditions and processes that define sufficient is dependent upon how, dependent upon how scientific your exploration is. Good science produces actual knowledge whereas bad science produces only pseudo-knowledge. Knowledge, ignorance, truth, falsehood, good science, bad science, wisdom, foolishness, fact, fiction, open-mindedness, open-mindedness, and closed-mindedness almost always, almost always exists simultaneously in different proportions as they pertain to developing as in creating this trilogy or evaluating what you think of this trilogy, any piece or set of information. Rarely are knowledge and science perfect and pure. It is more a matter of degree and proportion. Perhaps all public thoughts, ideas, and published papers need to, clear, need to be clearly marked by the Federal Knowledge and Belief Administration. This concept contains 80% knowledge, 20% belief, an amusing thought with frightening overtones. Obviously, the only valid assessment is yours, and you must make it as correctly as possible. 
The quality of your mind and being hangs in the balance. You should not depend on experts, professionals, or anyone else to distinguish knowledge from belief for you. Even if you trust them more than you trust yourself and are willing to believe what they say. Conversely, you can only discriminate between belief and knowledge for yourself, not for others. Think about it. How do you discriminate actual truth tellers from those who only believe they are telling the truth? Hint, comparing their beliefs to your own is not the answer. You should take responsibility for separating belief from knowledge for yourself and only for yourself because you will reap the rewards of being correct or suffer the consequences of being wrong. Herd instincts going along with others who are themselves simply going along with others are counterproductive. There is no safety in numbers with regard to discovering big truth. Failing with the majority provides no consolation because all successes or failures are personal. No one can drag you along to success by thinking or experiencing for you. On the other hand, you may allow others to retard your progress by not thinking for yourself. Oh, that's a mouthful. It is true that to trust and assume the truth is often necessary at a mundane level and can be a useful shortcut in a world of ideas where we are time and experience limited. Nevertheless, you must be careful not to inadvertently absorb limitations on your mind's ability to expand or modify what you initially trust to be the truth. Be forever watchful for and open to new data. Do not block out or create do not block out or creatively or creative or create I'm sorry. Creatively. That's what it is. Do not block out or creatively reinterpret information that conflicts with your beliefs or what you desire or need truth to be. Good science starts with honesty, and honesty is most easily applied in an ego-free and fear-free environment. Belief is created when one who lacks scientifically evaluated knowledge puts faith in the premise that things actually are as he or she supposes them to be. Dogma is a fixed set of beliefs that must be accepted on faith in order to join the ranks of believers who share that particular dogma. I feel like we needed to read this before we get into the next tablet. I just now that I'm reading, I feel like some somebody like really needs this because as we go further, it's really gonna rip up some stuff, especially if you're still steeped in some portions of church tradition. It's 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 gonna shake what can be shaken. Listen, let me go back. Belief is created when one who lacks. Sorry, cause. Okay, belief is created when one who lacks scientifically evaluated knowledge puts faith. In the premise that things actually are as he or she supposes them to be. Dogma is a fixed set of beliefs that must be accepted on faith in order to join the ranks of believers who share that particular dogma. Dogma can be cultural, religious, scientific, or personal. It is an integral part of any category of belief. Knowledge that appears to be scientifically or objectively evaluated to a given individual may actually be incorrect. This is because we are not omniscient, our knowledge and data are limited, and because we each create our personal reality, objective and subjective, by, I'm sorry, hold on. This is because we are not om omniscient, our knowledge and data are limited, and because we each create our personal reality, objective and subjective by interpreting our experience belief and knowledge can be either false incorrect or true correct both in either state of correctness can strongly motivate action 
If you are presented with new information, new ideas, or new concepts that you think may possibly have merit, it is far better to maintain open-minded skepticism while collecting your data on the subject, even if it takes a lifetime, than to jump to conclusions based on some previously held belief or by adding a new belief. Hold on to all the possibilities, old and new, until you have produced the knowledge that correctly evaluates the issues by means of direct experience. The important thing is, you need to get out there and collect the data. Laziness or fear of incompetence on this issue produces high-risk results and dramatically reduces the possibility of significant gain or progress. The proof of correctness of any piece of knowledge lies only in the results it application, its application produces. That is true of any knowledge, objective or subjective, offered up from any source about anything, including any astute cerebral gems that you may find in this Big Toe Trilogy. If knowledge cannot be applied or its application produces no practical results, that knowledge is, by definition, useless and irrelevant. Before drawing, before drawing your sword of truth and hacking away at pseudo-knowledge, let me remind you of something. If you cannot productively apply a particular piece of knowledge or a new concept, then that knowledge or concept may be pseudo-knowledge or you may be ignorant and basing your evaluation of that knowledge or concept upon belief or pseudo-knowledge. For advice on how to deal with this logical dilemma, reread the aside at the beginning of this chapter. Results can be objective, subjective, complex, obvious, abstract, abstract or com concrete, but they must be real, actual results. They must eventually produce objectively measurable effects or changes by interacting with something that is real. Knowledge is only as significant as its effects. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. You will hear more about how to apply this results-oriented truth-testing concept in sections 3 and 5. For now, it is enough to understand that tasting the pudding refers to testing the value of your experience, truth, or knowledge by evaluating the objective, measurable results it produces. If what you consider to be true cannot honestly produce objective, measurable results, then remove it from the truth bin and put it back into the interesting possibilities bin. Continue collecting pertinent data and always maintain high scientific standards when evaluating results. If the results are not clear and obvious to yourself and others, you are either shooting blanks or you're playing with a toy gun. You should always keep in mind that results need to be measurable and meaningful. Here, meaningful includes advancing your personal development, increasing the quality of your evolving consciousness, and improving the correctness and depth of your understanding. Most of us are thoroughly dominated by beliefs, most of which lie outside of our intellectual awareness. How should we go about reexamining our beliefs? The proof of correctness of any belief lies in first removing the ignorance that necessitated the belief in the first place and replace it with knowledge or open-minded skepticism. Whenever sufficient knowledge has been accumulated to support logical scientific conclusions, apply that knowledge and observe the result. If the ignorance that defines the belief and upon which the necessity for the belief is based cannot be replaced by testable or using our pudding metaphor, tasteable knowledge, then the belief simply remains a belief and its falseness and correctness remain unproven. No intelligent comment can be made either way and you should remain skeptical as well as open-minded until enough data are collected to provide testable knowledge. 
And I think I want to pause right there. Yeah, I'm going to pause right here. Okay. So we're going to pause right here. And we'll pick it back up tomorrow after we read Tablet 6. So that was good. And I think that that prepares, that prepares us, especially those who still kind of living in religious dogma and haven't let some pieces of it go away. And that's going to help you, right? It's going to help you. If you got it, go ahead and read ahead. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and get out of here. Look, I'm going to share. Let me, let me close first. I'm going to share with y'all. I had two, uh, um, what you call them? Missionaries come to my door yesterday from... Uh, what you call it? The the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. I wasn't gonna answer the door, but my husband was sitting right here, and they saw us looking at him. So hold on, let me close this. Okay, so it is Friday, y'all. February the fourth, twenty twenty two, day number twenty two of year four of reading through the books of the Law and the Prophets. Another four year consecutive day count. It is day one thousand and forty. Today we read Tablet 5 in the Book of Inky, and then we read Chapter 19, pages, I should have put pages, pages 134 to 137. Okay, so let me go ahead and do the blessing. I ain't going to call Bella down because she's going to want to end it right when I get done, and I want to tell y'all what happened yesterday. <laughs> okay. So the blessing is found, y'all know where, in Numbers chapter 6. Hold on. Verses 22 through 27. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise, ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah will kneel before us, presenting gifts, and will guard us with a hedge of protection. Yahuwah will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and he will provide us with love, sustenance, and friendship. Yahuwah will lift up the wholeness of his being and look upon us, and he will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, these people. Ow, semicolon. Shalom, shalom. Okay, so we're sitting here yesterday. So we're sitting here working on some quotes for some projects and everything. You know, we got this Bay Wonder right here. So we're sitting here just talking. Next thing we know, we just I'm like, who is these guys? And my husband turned around. They was coming off of Mr. Henry Porch. Clearly, Mr. Henry didn't answer the door. Mr. Henry got cameras and stuff. And so I'm like, yeah, Mr. Henry probably looking at them. And it's like, yeah, I ain't answering the door. So they come in. They walk out of Mr. Henry yard. And they walk from his yard over here looking at us. And like, we made eye contact with both these young boys, right? They, they, shucks, they look like they, they just turned 18. They probably could have been a little bit older. Nice, freshly, they don't, I ain't gonna say they was freshly shaven. I don't even think they had any kind of facial hair at all. At all. But they look fresh out the womb, right? Walking in their, 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 their black slacks. Their nice pressed button down shirt with their Book of Mormon or whatever it was in their hand, right? And so they come, and as they're walking past the window, I'm like, they better keep walking. James just started giggling. We looked at them. They both caught eye contact with us and came and walked right up on our porch. I'm like, <sighs> and I'm sitting here. I'm like, what What you say that price was? And he looked at me. He said, go answer the door. I said, I ain't got time for it. I, I don't. I, no. They just going to have to walk away. Let's finish doing this quote. He said, man, go answer the door. Don't be rude. I'm like, oh, y'all back. Okay, I'm sorry. I was trying to move the thing out the way. He was like, man, don't be rude. I'm like, rude? They going to be rude. I was like, I'm not. I'm just, let them walk away. He said, Pam, they sitting here staring. I said, I don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> he said, he said, just go say something. I was like, I'm going to shoo them away from the door. That's what I'm about. I was like, oh, okay. And I'm like, okay. So I went to the door and they were like, hi, ma'am. I'm like, hey. <laughs> and they said that it was kind of, and I wasn't. I was gonna play with them, but I was like, I really don't have, I really don't have the time to play with them like I really want to play with them. So I'm just gonna get rid of them quick because I really need to finish these quotes <laughs> so we can get going. And so James was like, just he he looking like just just say something to him, say something like because he want me to give them the whole you know let them know what they doing is wrong and there's one creator you know I didn't have time for all that today. I just didn't feel like it. So it was like, hi, ma'am. I was like. Hey, they said, um, well, we're missionaries from Jesus Christ Church of the Latter-day Saints. Is that how you say it? We're, 
uh, missionaries from Jesus Christ Church of the Latter Day Saints, and I changed. I purposely changed my uh, facial expression. I'm like, yeah, and <laughs> just to see if I could get any kind of rise out of them, right? And I was like, yeah, and they said, well, um, well, we wanted to know if we could share with you um, a few scriptures and let you know like what we believe and just to see if you would be interested in it. They said, is this something you'll be interested in? I said, no. They said, and they were shocked because where I said no. They said, well, do you know anybody else here in the neighborhood or you may have some friends who might win? I said, no. <laughs> they was like, the one behind me, like, he like looked down and it looked like he said, well, darn. I said, no. And he said, okay. Well, can we pray for you then before I said, if you want to pray in the name of Jesus Christ, let me just tell you now, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the one creator. And I did like this. I put my foot on. That. I said, I believe in one creator of heaven and earth. And I call him Yahuwah. I said, and if you're not going to pray to him or you're going to try and pray to him in the name of Jesus Christ. No, you can't pray for me. And I'm not going to give you the names of anybody else to pray for them in the name of Jesus Christ. Because I don't believe in Jesus Christ. And it was like. <laughs> they said well okay ma'am well uh you have a nice day it was like they was like they was trying to figure out words to say it was like well uh okay well you have a nice day i said toodles i did just like that and i came in james was in here hollering laughing i said look man you should have went and i uh answered i was like I probably messed them little boys up. I said, I ain't really have time today. I would have, I, I would have had I had the time. I would have stood out there and I would have let them go through what they was talking about just to be like, y'all are really wasting your time here, right? So, but I thought that was, that was funny. It was hilarious. Kurt, what was your question? He said, I didn't answer your question. Oh, oh, yeah. Man, I asked you to look up Jubilee chapter one, verse 13. Let me look it up. What do I pull from it? Okay, let me see. Jubilees. Oh, and they will forget all my law and all my commandments and all my judgments and will go astray as to new moons and Sabbaths and festival festivals and jubilees and ordinances. It that it mean i think it means just what it says just like israel is you want to call us israel israel was lost like as we were as we were removed from our culture and who we really are yeah they probably didn't want to go and ask questions Trina. I, I was banking on it i was banking on screwing them up in the head so they can at least go ask questions because they just robots out here doing what their masters tell them to do they don't they don't ask they're too afraid they're too afraid to ask questions because if they were asking questions they wouldn't be going door to door right that's how i know they just following along like the 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 sleep masses sheep headed to the slaughter right um but yeah i i think that means it exactly what it says because if you think about it, if you look at israel you can look at how they've been toying with time the different festivals everything it it i take verse 13 at face value most of you who is people at least until like recent days of people waking up they have they forgot his laws like they tell you old testament is done away when you ain't got to keep none of that things were orchestrated to remove people remove people from you who was laws his statutes and his commandments completely doing away with them because when you do away with them you do away with the other things that connects with them even the the time where it, and it says you're going to go with stress to new moons sabbaths festivals jubilees and ordinances like people celebrating the sabbath on the wrong days you know but as you get into it and you read more and more you begin to ask questions and that's what caused me to start looking into the sabbath um um watch the rotation of the sun and the moon and the stars especially when i got into enoch i'm like okay so what we doing is not necessarily lining up and then paying attention to our calendar and the 
the Hebrew calendar, the different calendars they had. Everybody got a different calendar. So if everybody has a different calendar, how are y'all even celebrating things on right now? Who like who is the authority for this? Are we just saying Jerusalem of the Israelites, they're the authority just because they're doing it this way. But there are clearly things that they're doing according to their calendar that I can see that goes against what the commandments say. I said something is wrong, right? And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to have to look at this myself because I keep getting different answers from different people. And all they're doing is regurgitating garbage that they got from somebody else that taught them the garbage, right? So, which is why... Um, I started really looking into it, literally going outside daily, looking at the moon and the sun in a position and how it seem, may seem elementary. But when you observe something, you begin to notice things that you never really noticed before. If you just live in life, just walking through every day, oh, the sun feels nice, right? You don't notice how the moon changes her circuit during certain months. And how you can see her in the sky during the day. You may look and not really pay attention. But every single month, she began, She starts at the same point for most of the year with the exception of three months. You know, and then it's like, depending on where you're at, it's like you can't find her. Where did she go? Where did the moon go? You know, and I start searching, looking and driving. Oh, well, why did it start over here this month? Like there is such wisdom that can be gleaned just by observing the sky. It will blow your mind. That Yah is real. Yeah, shalom, shalom. Um, so that I mean that that's what that's what I that's what I understand from Jubilee chapter one verse thirteen. It you can literally take that verse at face value. You know, you can look at we we're in no we we're living that. Half the people don't even half the half of y'all's people. The real Israel, if you want to call them real Israel, who are still in the church and don't even realize that they're Israel, even some of them that have come out of the church and still following like Christian ways and wrong information, um, they don't even realize even like the Sabbath. They're fighting over the Sabbath days. They're fighting this Friday. You know, it's Saturday. Regents, if you're following the Gregorian calendar, it's not set on that one day according to the Gregorian calendar. What you have to understand, like the clock in the sky, now, astronomers and the way they got the clocks, the watches and clocks set up, if you pay attention to it, they've actually got that down to a T, but they feed you information. But you can you can tell when the Sabbaths are if you understand the rotation of the sun and the moon or at least the positions of the moon and the phases. Right. If you're ever stranded and don't have a watch, nobody you can't ask anybody what the time is. If you've been paying attention to the rotation of the sun and the moon, watch how the sun casts shadows. You, you, If you can, even if you don't have anything, if all you have is your body, watch how your body casts shadows on the ground at the different phases of the sun as she moves through, as he moves through the sky during the day. You'll be able to tell time. They've simply taken that information that people have known before manually, and they just digitized everything for you. And now... You don't even know how to calculate it appropriately. So it's easy to pull the wool over your eyes when you don't really understand how it works, right? And you don't necessarily have to understand how it works, but you will hope that those who are teaching you aren't trying to pull the wool over your eyes because you don't understand it. You will hope they will teach you the right way. Hope that they're honest people. Yes. What did you just do? What did I just do? Can't you not pull? Mom, um, I hear you just go outside. I, that wasn't me. That was one of your brethren. It was one of them. I think it was Josh. Josh went to the door. Why? I don't know. Go ask them. They're all in the living room now. Um, so, but yeah, you can you can you can read that and literally just take that that verse at face value, based on my experience up until the date and everything I've done in research. That's literally face value. The 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 nations has have caused you who is people not just to forget those things, but who they are. But if you read a little bit further, it talks about a time when Yahuwah's people will begin to wake up and realize, oh my gosh, we have been sinning. We have completely turned away from your Torah, right? And they begin to wake up and they begin to seek him with all their heart. Like what we're doing, we got to get to the truth. They've added stuff. Yeah, they've burnt your Torah. They've recreated it. They've added stuff. They've taken away. So now we really have to, we really have to do the job of scientists, really, and really, yes, that is this. Um, good question. I forgot what that do, but put it back. I know it's cute. It's, I think it's a, 
It's a, I think it's a potato thing. I don't know, girl. I need to look at my stuff. I think I should throw it in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, it's a potato thing. You put the potato up there, you stick it up there, and you twist it, and it give you the different shapes. Mom, so, but Mom, yeah, y'all. She's Mom, starting to do too much. I'm going to go ahead and end this. Mom, yes. I can, I can mash. I can make mashed potatoes with this. Uh, no, you're you're not gonna be able to make mashed potatoes with that. But you can make like potato strings and stuff with that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, y'all. So with that being said, that that's it for today. We we'll go ahead and get out of here. Tuda, we already did the blessing, but you can go ahead. Go ahead and... Aww, we are done. I know. See, because I wanted to tell them this story, I went ahead and did the blessing. Because if you had to come do the blessing, we'll do the blessing again. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Okay. Double blessing today. And it can't hurt, right? Okay, so let's pull up the blessing again. The blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. <laughs> and Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah will kneel before us, presenting gifts, and will guard us with a hedge of protection. You who will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and he will provide us with love, sustenance, and friendship. You who will lift up his wholeness of being and look upon us, and he will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. I love y'all. See y'all back here tomorrow morning, bright and early, 7.30, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.